Now this fight happened many, many moons ago. And I remember at the time, those of us who have YouTube channels and we do boxing stories, we were searching for the footage and wondering if the footage would ever be released. The fight I'm talking about, of course, is Deontay Wilder against Harold Sconius, a journeyman heavyweight who Deontay Wilder fought within his first 30 fights and he dropped Deontay Wilder heavily. And according to this article here on World Boxing News, and bear in mind, before I go further, World Boxing News, I think it's fair to say, comes across and has always come across as very pro-American for one, but more specifically, very pro-PBC, Al Heyman, and so on. Okay, so they don't come across as the most objective website. But nevertheless, they have done some interesting articles and you know, put out some very interesting information over the years. And so this very pro-PBC, pro-Deontay Wilder website says here that according to those at ringside, Wilder was flattened and down for longer than 10 seconds in the Harold Sconia's fight. He was ultimately saved by the bell with a slow count. Now I can well believe that. And uh, it says here Wilder was 12 and 0, okay, when the Scon when he uh, went into the Sconia's fight. So it would have been his 13th professional bout. Slow count. Deontay Wilder has been protected for years and years and years and years. I mean, people talk about manufactured fighters and protected fighters. Look no further than Deontay Wilder. And that's not to say that Deontay Wilder didn't have talent or doesn't have talent. Of course, he's got talent in terms of punching power. Got a massive heart too. But the way his career has been managed, he was a protected fighter all along. I mean, this guy was, what, over 30 fights deep when he became WBC world champion and they kept him away from Klitschko. Why can't you unify when you're over 30 fights deep? A bronze medalist at the Olympics, so you can't unify with Klitschko? The guy was protected. And the only reason they even put him in with Luis Ortiz is because Luis Ortiz, and that was when Wilder was nearly 40 fights deep, right? They put him in with Ortiz, 35 and 0, whatever he was at the time. The only reason they put him in with Ortiz is because Ortiz signed with PBC. Prior to Ortiz signing with PBC when Ortiz was with Matchroom, you never heard about. Deontay Wilder was coming up with reasons not to fight Ortiz then. <laughs> All right? But as soon as Ortiz signed with PBC, bam, they made the Wilder fight. That's how PBC work. Yeah? Especially with their more vulnerable fighters, they don't want to take risks outside of house. They want to keep everything in house. And that's how it was with Wilder. And when it comes to Tyson Fury, they thought Fury was finished. They saw him losing 100 pounds in weight and how overweight he was during his time away from the ring. Tyson Fury openly said that he thinks that's the only reason Wilder agreed to fight him at that time. Because Wilder's team thought Fury was done. <laughs> they thought he was cooked. And when it comes to the rematch, well, Wilder dropped Fury twice in the first fight. Never managed to hurt him. So... Again, Wilder's team are thinking, ah, oh, well, Deontay will get him next time, right? So Wilder has been a protected fighter his whole career. And part of the reason for that was what happened in the Harold Sconia's bout, where according to reports, he got flattened. He was down for longer than 10 seconds. And talking about the Ortiz fight, in the first Ortiz fight, Wilder gets hurt, whatever round that was, six or seven. And inexplicably, after the round, right? He goes back to his corner. They have the minute in the corner. And then they come out for the next round. And the doctor gets Deontay Wilder to come over. To I mean, why can't the doctor examine him in between rounds? They gave Deontay Wilder extra time to recover in that Ortiz fight. Okay, this is how much protection Deontay Wilder has always had. <laughs> but... You know, not being very bright, not being very self-aware, Deontay Wilder doesn't seem to even acknowledge the fact that he's been protected his whole career. He points fingers at other fighters, but he's the one that's been protected for so long. And again, this Sconia's thing would have been uh, alarming for Deontay Wilder's people, and they moved him very, very slowly thereafter. And it says there, no footage is available. Deontay Wilder was promoted by Golden Boy at the time, and the Mexican TV station covering the event only take the main event and not the undercard fights, apparently. Now, Sconius speaks here about 
Deontay Wilder's punching power. And he says he wasn't particularly impressed by it at the time. He said, you know, tell you the truth, I didn't really, out of all the guys I fight, I wouldn't really rank Wilder at that time in the top as far as power punches. I fell in the beginning mostly just because of nerves. Man, I was so nervous and he came out aggressively. Okay, that's what Harold Sconia said at the time. Now, Deontay has always been a clumsy fighter and he's even more clumsy the further back you go in his career. And when you're dealing with a clumsy guy like that, he's going to struggle with his accuracy. Some of his shots are going to be scuffing shots. They're not going to be at the right distance. You know, a lot of them are not going to be landed on the knuckle properly. And I certainly saw this in a lot of Deontay Wilder's very early bouts. So, yeah, he probably wasn't connecting with the kind of clean shots back then as often as we see him today. Like the shot that knocked out Robert Hellenius and the shots he's hit Tyson Fury with, uh, Luis Ortiz and other fighters, right? So, I'm sure Deontay Wilder could hit tremendously hard back then, but he just wasn't as good at landing the shot with full power, you know, on the target area at the right time. It took fights and fights and fights for him to develop that skill of being able to land the right hand consistently. If you put him on a bag, I'm sure he could hit very hard back then, but he just wasn't able to do it in the ring against the moving opponent who's hitting him back as consistently as he is now. You see, so that's the thing about punching power. It's more than just, there are loads of guys out there who if you put them on a heavy bag, trust me, they can hit as hard as the world champions. And I'm just talking about certain random heavyweights in the gym, right? Or in, in any way, there are certain random guys in gyms who come in and they hit harder than a world champion on the back. But put them in the ring and try and get them to land those shots on a world-class fighter and they can't do it. <laughs> okay, because a yeah, world-class fighter is not just going to stand there like a heavy bag, not punching back. He's going to be moving around and, you know, you're going to have to adjust your feet and you're going to have to get your yourself set and get your balance right to generate the power. He's not going to stand there for you like a heavy bag in most instances. You see? So punching power is more than just the ability to plant your feet and throw hard shots. <laughs> you have to be able to do it on the move. You have to be able to do it quick. You have to be able to react to things in the ring and then all of a sudden set yourself and deliver these big shots. <laughs> it's much more complicated than you think. So, um... Yeah, with uh, Deontay Wilder's power that's developed over the years, I'm sure, or he's become more prolific with his power. I'm sure he was hitting hard on the bag back in the days, but now he can land those shots on actual opponents. So uh, anyway, just thought it was an interesting story to read about Deontay Wilder, Harold Sconias. Obviously, it's old news. We all know about this, but just hearing from Sconias himself, I thought was uh, quite interesting and how he felt, you know, and look, this is Harold Sconia's record over here, for those of you who don't know much about him. He was, as you can see, clearly a journeyman. More losses than wins, 18, 27, and two. And when he fought Deontay Wilder, let's have a look. Back in 2010, he was stopped in four rounds. Ultimately, he was down four times. Wilder was down once, but that could have been a knockout loss for Wilder. Uh, just as, by the way, you know, we talk about undefeated records, and uh, you know, I think it's it's fair, right? When you see fighters who really should have losses on their record and they don't, but yet they're running around talking about I'm undefeated and that makes me better than everybody else. Yeah, it's fair to look at Wilder against Sconias and say, well, maybe Wilder should have been 13 and 0, uh, excuse me, 12 and 1 after that rather than 12 and 0. Same with Anthony Joshua in the Olympics. A lot of people question that Olympic gold medal. Personally, I didn't really have an issue with the Camarell fight in the final. It was a close fight. The fight I had an issue with was his first round match against Eris Landy Savon. Because as far as I'm concerned, he lost that fight and lost it clearly. Okay? So if you want to question that, I've got no problem with that at all. Because AJ did not win that fight. So you could say that he shouldn't really have had a gold medal. And another example being Tyson Fury, the first John McDermott fight. According to John McDermott, and it's just his word, right? But 
I've never heard John Fury refute this. John McDermott said that after the first Tyson Fury fight, John Fury approached him literally either outside the venue where they had the fight or wherever it was in the dressing room. And he said to John McDermott, according to John, you won the fight and shook his hand. <laughs> That's what John McDermott said in an interview. So Tyson Fury really should have had a loss on his record there early on in his career. And we know this goes on, but certain guys have connections and they have the favor of certain people with influence within boxing. And so they're able to get away without taking losses which really should be on their record. You know, it goes for AJ Fury and Wilder in different situations. So yeah, that is what that is. That's boxing politics for you. We don't like it, but we have to live with it. And again, looking at Harold Sconia's record, Deontay Wilder, this was towards the end of Sconia's career as well. He fought for three years more after that, losing most of his fights. But even going into the Wilder fight, I mean, look at all these losses. And interestingly, Sconia's lost in the first round many times. Knocked out in one round in his final fight. Knocked out in one round by Kevin Johnson back in 2011. Knocked out in one round by Cedric Boswell. That was a former Lennox Lewis sparring partner also for Alexander Povetkin many years later. Remember, he's getting knocked out in one round by these guys. Knocked out by Berman Stavern in one round. Knocked out by Eric Kirkland. I remember Monty Barrett saying that Eric Kirkland was the hardest puncher he ever fought. Knocked out by Deval Williamson in one round. So you get the picture. Sconia's was... <laughs> Not to be uh, mean about it, but he was a pudding. He was there to be beaten by up and coming fighters. That's what it was. That's what that's his purpose in the ring was to be brought in to be uh, walked all over. But Deontay Wilder apparently made very heavy weather, weather of it. And if there'd been a fair referee, or at least according to this article, Deontay Wilder would have been counted out. Maybe that would have been the end of the Wilder story. So anyway, just thought I'd uh, do a video about that. I thought it was interesting. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below.